so excited to have Dr. Flores here today to give you guys an overview and introduction to acceptance and commitment training, which is also known as ACT. <clears throat> okay, so on the agenda for today, what I wanted to do was to provide um, more of an introduction to ACT. Um, so as Dr. Kim has mentioned, from a more behavior analytic perspective, it's usually referred to as acceptance and commitment training, but from more of a therapeutic standpoint, it may be referred to as acceptance and commitment therapy. You know, with that, what I wanted to do was give an introduction, um, go into some more detail about what ACT includes, um, talking about private events, which I know that in the field of behavior analysis may not always be, you know, talked about in, a, you know, with a lot of detail. And then following that, I wanted to go into just the core processes that make up ACT um, and then end with a one final exercise. Um, but before I do that, I did want to provide some what of an introduction to myself just to, uh, you know, provide some further context about who I am and in this topic as well. So I'm the, the current owner of Flex Learning, which is an ABA therapy company. Uh, so we're a traditional ABA therapy company where we're working with individuals um, as young as two all the way up until adulthood um, delivering ABA services. And within this whole experience, a lot of what we've been able to do with our clients um, and, you know, when I say clients, I mean the children or the adults that we directly work with and their caregivers. Um, and so when we've been able to incorporate that, you know, into our, our work, we've been um, able to outline some methods of ACT into the treatment, right? So that may mean that we're working with clients to get them to a point where they are a little bit more present and they're engaging in some really uh, values-driven behavior, which I'll go into with more detail a little bit later on, um, or even with some other caregivers and parents, right? Teaching them how to really work towards delivering, you know, or implementing a lot of these behavior intervention plans that sometimes are really difficult to implement. And so, you know, how can ACT help in order to, to make that happen? In addition to that, I'm an adjunct instructor. And so, in my teaching, I've taught courses relating to clinical skills, as well as the assessment process and, you know, the delivery of services. And I do like to incorporate a lot of act-based approaches in that as well, whether it's specific to the students I'm interacting with or um, even with the content that I'm teaching so that there can be some familiarity about ACT and how that you know applies back to the field of, of behavior analysis. I have implemented ACT on a more personal level and then on a more professional level as well. So on a more personal level, um, that's where my interest started with ACT. At the end of my master's program, and I started to hear a little bit about ACT and it was, you know, around and there was a lot of work being done, but in my program, it, it wasn't really talked about. So I did some um, individual research, you know, just to kind of familiarize myself, went to uh, some conferences, presentations, workshops, just to really understand the topic a lot more. And so what I wanted to do was really implement some of the ACT-based methods on myself so that I could better understand what, what it really is and how it can really help others that I'm working with or others that I'm interacting with. And so in my view, it makes a whole lot of sense to start that from a more personal level so that then the person who's engaging um, or, you know, imp implementing ACT in their practice has a, a firsthand experience about how it works. Um, on a more professional level, I have, as I mentioned before, been able to use it with clients in, our, in my agency, um, as well as with, you know, more uh, educational methods as well. So after my master's, I completed my PhD and in my PhD program, my dissertation was specifically focused on ACT with my employees. And so that was a, just a whole nother experience for myself to really see how I can take what I, you know, learned, apply it in a different context, and then, you know, teach others to potentially implement some of these methods as well. So, you know, with all of that, the ownership, previous work experience in my education, that's all kind of led up to me just being really interested and wanting to continue to talk about ACT. Um, I feel that, you know, in, in this field, I know that there's some divide between whether it's something that, you know, we should be focusing on and implementing, but I've seen firsthand that it, it can be really effective. Now, you know, with that said, we obviously have to be careful because how the, you know, um, our ethical guidelines, you know, may outline, we do have to make sure that there's enough training, experience, oversight so that we can implement a lot of this. But again, the purpose for today is really just to provide that introduction so that, you know, those who are viewing the presentation can hopefully um, either refresh if you heard some of this or, um, you know, just look into the topic a little bit further and, and hopefully that will spark, you know, a, another interest. So to start off, I'll talk a little bit about what ACT is and how it was developed. Um, it was initially developed by Steve Hayes in the 1980s. Um, so it was him and a few other practitioners. And the idea behind ACT is that it is approached in a more radical behaviorism approach, right? So meaning that when we look at behavior, we're taking into consideration the entirety of the individual, right? So the things that are happening on the external environment, as well as 
as the more, you know, quote unquote, internal environment and how that influences the individual on their day to day. With ACT, um, it is seen as an evidence-based approach that helps somebody work through their private events. Um, and when I say private events, that typically refers to the thoughts that we have. Um, again, I know that in you know, behavior analysis, it sometimes is something that we don't you know, really address or talk about in greater detail. But if you, you know, do see behavior analysis from a more radical behavioristic approach, then we can say that everything that the individual does is behavior. And so with the thoughts, you know, or these private events that the individual is engaging, that is going to affect the overt behaviors that they will, um, you know, function on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so with uh, ACT, what we're essentially looking at is to combine mindfulness plus acceptance to allow an individual to really just maximize the potential in their life via uh, behavior change processes. And so with ACT, you'll see that it does include a lot of exercises that uh, one can experience in the moment, as well as really furthering the uh, idea of language and how that influences our behaviors. And then it also incorporates a lot of metaphors to address the potential symptoms that somebody may be experiencing when using ACT. So generally in ACT, there are a few different processes that are at play that make up, you know, what acceptance and commitment training is. So that does include uh, cognitive diffusion, acceptance, present moment awareness, values, committed action, and self as context. So I will go into those in a little bit more detail a little bit later on, because that's how, you know, if this is new to you, you're going to understand more or less what makes up the, the processes behind ACT. ACT in and of itself does have uh, its underlying roots in what's called relational frame theory. So that's really the behavioral theory of human language and cognition. And so I'm going to also go into a little bit more detail with that just to provide some perspective on what that really includes and how that relates back to ACT. Another question, you know, is where does ACT come from, right? So you can see that on the screen, there's a pyramid. Um, and this is to represent more of a hierarchy or like a process of, you know, where ACT is and where it came from. So at the bottom level of the pyramid, we have what's called functional contextualism. And so this is basically the philosophy. So that foundation of what makes up ACT. And so what this is looking at is how events will function in, spe in specific contexts. And if we were to analyze them, it would tell us that there really is no faulty or dysfunctional view. Uh, it just really all depends on the context of the situation. Because as you may know, with behavior, each behavior serves a purpose, right? There's always a function for the behavior. And so even though it may not be the more socially appropriate behavior in the situation, it essentially does work for the individual, right? So if I can think about clients who may engage in some physical aggression to, you know, get access to what they need, right? We would say that that's definitely not a socially appropriate behavior, but it works for the individual because in that moment, then they're able to get what they need in a more efficient and fast manner. So with functional contextualism, what it's looking at is that theory that, you know, every individual is going to engage in behaviors to, you know, get their needs met essentially. And, you know, it's all going to just really depend on the situation at hand uh, of how, how that looks. So to kind of illustrate that a little bit more, um, I will just do like a, a quick exercise um, so that, you know, those of you that are watching can kind of visualize that in a different way as well. So if you can just imagine a chair with four legs, right? So it's just the typical chair that you would see in your home or office or whatever. So now imagine that something happens to the chair. And then when somebody sits on that chair, one of the legs uh, ends up falling off. So the question is, would you describe this chair as being broken, you know, potentially faulty or damaged? Typically, right, the first response may be yes. With a chair that only has three legs, there's only so much that you can do with it. With that, now we would want to think about some context in which the chair would serve its purpose of having just three legs, right? So some examples of that could be maybe somebody is playing a practical joke on somebody. And so, you know, the, when the third the fourth leg falls off, it serves its purpose. Or maybe, you know, this chair is actually part of an art exhibit. And, you know, there's some common theme within the studio about abstract furniture, right? Um, or potentially, it can be used as a prop in some type of comedy or some type of musical. Or lastly, it may be that the person who's using this chair is trying to improve their balance or their coordination. And so they're needing something that they would have to balance on three legs as opposed to the four, four legs. So with that, again, it's really illustrating that fun functional contextualism in that when we look at a behavior or just something, you know, in its environment, we are really trying to understand the purpose that it's serving, right? And so it may serve its purpose in a few different situations, 
or it may not. It just really depends on, on who's, you know, viewing that perspective. But that's essentially the theory of acceptance and commitment training. Now, after that, we have ABA, right? And so with ABA, it doesn't need a whole lot of explanation, but it's basically, you know, the application of behavioral change tactics, you know, that's used to um, really just help th the way that we are looking at behavior, assessing it, and trying to, um, you know, really uh, make things a, a lot more better, I guess, for the individual. And then after that, we have relational frame theory, which looks at how we derive relations based off of these previously learned histories. So uh, just to give a little bit more information on that, when we're born, right, um, there's a lot that we still aren't able to do. So a big part of that is language, right? So as babies and toddlers, we rely on the world around us to help us really get to a point where we're able to talk more and do more. And so typically the way that that happens is that parents start talking to us, right? They may start using words, may start singing songs. And so then the babies or the toddlers will then start engaging in some of those sounds as well. After that, the parents will usually reinforce to some degree, you know, all of these different sounds and words that are coming from the baby's mouth. Um, and then over time, this baby learns to associate what they've learned and actually produce those sounds out in the environment to then get their needs met, right? Whether it's they're wanting mom's attention or dad's comfort or, you know, whatever um, else they may be needing in their environment. Um, and so with uh, relational frame theory or um, RFT, it's really allowing us to see how the same strengths that we learn can allow us to then cause um, a more of suffering, you know, between individuals. And again, I'll go into that with a little bit more detail. So here is a cumulative record of ACT studies that have been conducted since 19, since, since 19, um, I can't see that, uh, 1986. And so, you know, as you can see in the very beginning, there were, um, you know, some minimal studies that were conducted. Then over time, there's been a lot more. And so just to, you know, provide more of a snapshot, in 2008, there was a meta-analysis uh, that concluded that the evidence was very limited for ACT for it to be considered more of as a supported treatment. Um, so it did initially raise some methodological concerns about, you know, just the, the research and its utility. Then in 2009, there was a meta-analysis that found that ACT was more effective than a placebo and treatment as usual for most problems. So this is with the exception of, you know, things like anxiety and depression. And then in 2012, there was another meta-analysis that was more positive and it reported that ACT outperformed cognitive and behavior therapy. Um, and then in 2015, there was a review that found uh, ACT to be better than a placebo and was also the typical treatment for anxiety disorders, um, as well as depression and addiction. And so, you know, in this presentation, I'm talking about some of these more clinical diagnoses, um, but know that with ACT, it is used in those settings. And again, it can be used in more behavior analytic settings as well. But what I'm you know, trying to illustrate here is that ACT does have you know, its course of where it really first started and then where it's ending or at least where it's at at the, at the present moment. So with ACT, it's been used, you know, across a few different settings. So I talked a little bit before about more of the, the clinical approaches and where it's been used. ACT has also been used with employees where they've presented them with some type of ACT training to then be able to help manage stress in their work setting. Additionally, it's been worked on with clients in a more therapeutic setting. So I mentioned before, you know, anxiety, depression, and all of these other um, clinical diagnoses. It's also been used with children. Um, so, you know, an example is uh, using ACTS to increase more social interactions between peers. Um, it's also been used with parents, right? So there's been a study where they actually um, worked with parents to identify what they uh, titled as values-based behaviors. So those were the, the behaviors that were really important as it relates to parenting so that they can engage in more of those values-based behaviors when they're interacting with their children. Finally, it's also been used with students um, in college. An example of that has been when, where they've used ACT to influence the levels of stress that the college students were experiencing while they were enrolled in the semester. As you can see here, there is a variety of different settings and individuals in where ACT can be used. And so again, it's about really understanding the processes at play and how you know, we may be able to deliver this in some of these different um, settings. Okay, so as far as how we view our private events, so you know, typically in society, when an individual engages in more maladaptive patterns of behavior, as I've stated before, it may be labeled as damaged or potentially faulty. And so what typically may happen is that we may try to fix or repair those private events, right? So um, I think 
from a more cultural standpoint, we've seen that if somebody's experiencing, you know, what looks like anxiety or what looks like aggression towards other people, our first aim is to really fix or to, you know, push away whatever it is that we're feeling or what we're experiencing in that moment and trying to turn that into something positive. And so ACT takes a different approach. It doesn't uh, take the approach of let's push it away and try to make it into something positive. What it does instead is that it focuses on acceptance of those challenging states of, you know, how, how the person is experiencing and transform it into something that's a little bit more productive for the individual. So again, just kind of transforming, you know, what the person is experiencing into something that can help them in their environment and it can help them live a more full and driven life. In the end, what it's looking at is that ACT is looking to help humans create more meaningful lives while engaging in more mindful and values-driven uh, behaviors as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll move over to the RFT example. So, you know, RFT is something I talked about before. I just want to provide a very basic understanding of this because this will also help as we move through some of the processes. But at, you know, the very basic level, let's say we have a child and, you know, this child has never, is, is at first learning to talk, right? And so then what ends up happening is that they um, end up saying the word car because maybe they've heard their parents say car. So they say car and let's say, you know, they're uh, old enough to see, you know, words on paper. So then what we do is we write out the word car, right? And so here what's taking place is that we're going to teach the child that the word car represents the written word car, right? And then we're going to teach the opposite way in that the written word car uh, equals the spoken word of car, right? And so from there, what ends up happening is that let's say we bring out a toy, right? And this toy is, you know, just a, a black toy car that we have in the toy box. And so then we teach this child that the written word car represents the car that they have in their toy box. And so the cool thing with, you know, something like RFT is that then the child may derive that the car that they have in their hand actually represents the written word, right? So this was something that was not necessarily taught, but it was derived from that initial teaching between the written word and the actual car itself. So at the very basic level, again, that's, you know, RFT, but as it relates back to ACT, um, what we can then do to extend, you know, this illustration is that, you know, let's say that there's a moment where the child is with his father in the car. And let's say that, unfortunately, there's some type of car accident, you know, it's not an extreme one, but it's, it's big enough to cause some damage to the car and even, you know, for the people that are inside the car. So what happens is that after this accident, the child has then associated that potential car with the actual car accident. And so then what may happen is that they may derive that this car accident is going to represent either, either them being in, in every car or just any car that they have in front of them. So let's kind of take that a little bit further. And let's say that then anytime somebody says the word car, now they've started to feel all sorts of things in their body, right? So they started to feel like their chest has a lot of pressure in it on it. They feel like their body's clenching up a bit. Maybe they feel a little bit hot. Maybe they, they feel a little bit of pain in, in their neck from, you know, when they were in that car accident. And so this is something that is not directly taught. But as you can see here, it's derived that from this accident and somebody mentions the word car, this child may start experiencing some of these symptoms that, you know, they've experienced when they were in that car accident. And so, again, that's vice versa, right? So maybe they see another car accident and then they start experiencing, you know, some of those same symptoms. And so here, this is allowing us to understand that, you know, relationships are built by the things that we ex experience that are less apparent, right? So initially, I was talking about how as a child, you're learning, you know, how to come up with these words, right? It, it's not done uh, magically, right? There's a process for it. But then the same thing goes for things that may not be seen as positive in our life. So Again, this child, you know, went through some kind of experience and now anytime that they see a car or hear about a car, they're experiencing all of these symptoms that is making it a little bit hard for them, you know, to really experience their, their environment. Again, how does this relate to ACT? So given the previous explanations, what we can see is that there's some derived relations. Uh, they're creating some networks between the things that we're seeing, experiencing and learning. And then it's transferring the function, right? So initially car was very neutral, right? This child learned that car meant car. Um, but then after the accident, it added something to that, right? There's these feelings, again, of the tightness in their chest or the hotness in their body and, and so on and so forth. 
And so that's now changed, right? Initially, it was this neutral item, and then it's moved into something that's a little bit more, quote unquote, anxiety producing. In this way, you know, we can view this as the same way we view language between, uh, you know, us and ourselves. So let's say a person, you know, views themselves as, you know, potentially depressed. They may then state to themselves that they are, you know, uh, worthless or not really able to, you know, enjoy the 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 time that they're engaging in in that environment. And so this is going to create this pattern of private events that will transfer into the individual and make it harder for them to really, you know, live their life as full as possible. And so relational framing, what I just talked about, you know, in the previous illustration, is that it can be great because it allows us to do a lot of things. So this allows us to maybe plan, invent, compare, analyze, but it also makes it difficult for us because then it uh, produces some of these challenging private events that will impact how we see ourselves and how we see the environment. So in this presentation, I also do have some short videos because I also think that with some of these illustrations, it's going to provide a, a lot more context. The human mind has evolved to think in such a way that it naturally creates psychological suffering. You see, back in the Stone Age, 200,000 years ago, life was pretty dangerous for our caveman ancestors. So if a caveman or cavewoman wanted to survive, their minds had to constantly be on the lookout for things that might hurt or harm them. And if that cave person's mind wasn't good at predicting, spotting, or avoiding danger, what happened to her? The default setting of the caveman mind was safety first. And we in the modern world have inherited this. Our modern minds are constantly warning us of things that might hurt or harm us. The caveman mind says, watch out, there might be a bear in that cave, you could get eaten. Watch out, that shadow on the horizon might be an enemy from another clan, you could get speared. Our modern mind then does worrying, predicting the worst, avoiding anything that scares you, anxiety in all of its different forms. Back in caveman days, you survive an encounter with a bear or a wolf, then it's useful to replay it. It's useful for your mind to go over the events and remember what you did to survive so that you're better prepared for next time. But in our modern world, we go over and over painful memories, dwelling on them, reliving them, even when there's nothing useful to learn or the lesson has been well and truly learned a long time ago. In the Stone Age era, as a caveman or cavewoman, you have to fit in with the group. If you are alone, you will soon die. So your mind compares you to others in the group. Am I fitting in? Am I contributing enough? Am I following the rules? Am I doing anything that might get me thrown out? Now, in modern life, we're always comparing ourselves to others. But the problem is, we're no longer in a small group. Our groups are enormous today, and we carry with us devices that constantly feed us images and stories of people all over the planet. This constant comparison ramps up our fear of being judged or rejected, or not fitting in, or just not being good enough. The caveman mind tells you, you need more food, you need more water, better weapons, better shelter. The cave people who thought this way lived longer and had more offspring. Unfortunately, in the modern world, this manifests as greed, dissatisfaction, craving, wanting, it's never enough, I need more, more, more. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, these Stone Age thought patterns are intensified by the sheer pace and complexity of modern life. Our frantic existence, rushing from task to task, that never-ending to-do list. So, when your mind starts doing this unhelpful stuff, as all minds do, remember, it's not defective or abnormal and it's not deliberately trying to make your life difficult. It's simply doing the job it has evolved to do, trying to keep you safe and save you from pain. All right, so with that video again, you know, the idea is to really illustrate how humans are really set up in their environment to operate. So it talks a little bit about how, you know, in the beginning, um, as, you know, humans in, you know, the very early stages, survival was, you know, the biggest motivator, really just wanting to make sure that, 
they were able to get by. And so that's evolved over time. And so some of the same things that we may see are transferred into the present day, but now there's a lot more that's taking place. And so again, with that, the idea is that, you know, can we identify what some of those challenges are and figure out a way to make them, you know, a little bit more productive for ourselves to, you know, really help us maximize our lives a bit better. So with ACT as an intervention, what it's looking to do here, it looks to assume that even when there is tremendous suffering happening by the individual, there's still an opportunity to find meaning. And ACT further aims to help people learn and grow uh, more as a result of their suffering to embrace the pain that they um, are experiencing and really just foster that growth. Um, and so as humans, you know, we can all say that we experience all these different emotions and they can be operationally defined in a few different ways. And then we also may engage in more private events. Again, these are the thoughts where we may second guess ourselves or doubt or compare ourselves to others. And so with ACT, it's aiming to take that into account while providing more of a robust set of strategies to help the individual. So how is this targeted? With ACT, we want to, at least my personal recommendation, recommendation is to ensure that you know one can fully implement ACT on themselves in order to have a full understanding of if this is even something that they would want to you know, implement in practice. Now, using ACT on oneself would be a good place to start. You know, additionally, ACT is used in a more typical one-to-one -one therapy setting, as well as you know, parent consultation or more uh, group and individual settings. But the idea here is that there's some flexibility with how ACT is delivered and what the, the overall purpose or the end goal for ACT is. So as far as the processes, these are some of the, the six processes that make up ACT, right? And so at the middle of everything, we have what's called psychological flexibility. And the definition of that refers back to all of the processes that are illustrated in what's called the hexaflex. So you can see that at the top, we have um, contact with the present moment. We have values, committed action, self as context, cognitive diffusion, and acceptance. And so with this hexaflex, there is no direct order. So it doesn't start at one specific one and go all the way around. What it's meant to, to be is, is an understanding of what, you know, makes up ACT. And so it can be that if, you know, somebody is implementing ACT with a client or with themselves, they can really start at any point. And, you know, the different lines represent that you may be able to jump across from one to the other. Again, in the middle, we have psychological flexibility, which I will go into with a little bit more detail. And each of them, while they are separated here in this, you know, hexagon, they help one, one, one another out. So this is where it makes up that end point of psychological flexibility. So in addition to, you know, what I previously presented, you can see that the top half of the hexaflex can be referred to as more of the commitment and the behavior change processes of ACT. And then at the bottom half, we can see that that's more of our mindfulness and acceptance-based procedures. Um, and so that's really just to further, you know, illustrate what is all involved when we're trying to understand these different processes. From there, we can also see that there um, are inverse relationships to each of the different processes that we've talked about, right? So if we're not engaging in present moment awareness, then what's happening is that the individual is potentially ruminating on their past or their future, right? About what did happen and what's going to happen. And so if somebody's engaging in those behaviors, they may not be present. In addition to that, if somebody is unable to identify what their values are, then they have a lack, potentially a lack of direction of where they want to go in life or how they want to pursue things. Following that, we have if somebody is unable to engage in more committed action, so doing things that is really important to them, then what may be happening is that they may be stuck or there's some inaction taking place by the individual. Then with self as context, so um, with this one, you know, it's really being able to identify yourself in relation to what's happening around you. But if the person is unable to do that, then they're really putting themselves in that content, right? And it's really then giving them the perspective of that, that they're very involved in what's taking place. And then following that, we have diffusion. So if somebody isn't able to diffuse, what's happening is that they are fusing with some of these private events that they're engaging in and further, you know, making it a little bit more challenging to operate a little bit better. Um, and then finally, we have our acceptance. So if somebody is unable to accept some of the challenges that they're facing, what they're doing instead is that they're trying to push away or avoid some of these more challenging situations. All right. So I'm going to, like I said, go into, with it, um, into a little bit more detail with each of the processes. So Contacting the present moment can also be referred to as being here and now. And so this first process refers to the action of experiencing our environment. So this, again, includes both our private and our external events um, as it's happening now, rather than focusing our attention on events that have happened in the past or events that have happened in the future. 
And so this is a really big part of being present, right? So being present in the moment allows us to experience more of these environmental contingencies that will directly and possibly enable a person or us to engage in a behavior that is functional at the moment. And so some methods to practice this skill can include tacting the environment through the different senses, which then leads the individual to observe what's happening in front of them. Um, and then this behavior, as you can see, would be incompatible with tacting previous or future private events. And so with this one, I also wanted to showcase another video. This one's a shorter one of an exercise that can be done to be a little bit more present. Five, four, three, two, one, grounding technique. This technique will take you through your five senses and remind you to be present. It can help you stay calm through tough or stressful situations. Take a deep belly breath to begin. Look around for five things that you can see and say them out loud. Pay attention to your body and think of four things that you can feel and say them out loud. Listen for three sounds. Say the three things out loud. Say two things you can smell. It's fine to move to another spot to smell something. If you can't smell anything, then name your favorite two smells. Say one thing you can taste. If you can't taste anything, then say your favorite thing to taste. Take another deep belly breath to end. All right, so with that specific exercise, what it's meant to do is to bring person to experience a little bit more awareness to what's happening in the moment, right? So talked about how with present moment awareness, if somebody's unable to do that, they're thinking about things that have happened in the past, things that have happened in the future. And so you know, can there be a way for us to bring that person to the moment, at least, temp you know, momentarily, so that then the focus shifts on what they've been experiencing or what they've been feeling to what's happening in front of them. So the next process is diffusion. And this one's also known as watch your thinking. And so here diffusion refers to how as individuals, we may engage in more rule governed behaviors. And so then when this occurs, we may fuse together with some of these private events. And then when the behaviors and private events are fused, the, the individual is then engaging in behavior that's controlled more by these private events. So therefore diffusion, what it's looking to do is help the individual take a step back and separate or detach from the private event. Um, and then really just watch it go instead of getting tangled up in the mess or, you know, try to alter the function of, of you know, what that person is experiencing. So for this one, I also have another video to kind of illustrate that. So this one, it's a, a metaphor um, by Dr. Russ Harris. Um, and it you know really just highlights what it, it looks like when we're trying to diffuse from these thoughts that we're you know having a hard time with. So imagine that you're sitting in front of a sushi train at one of those Japanese restaurants, and there are all these dishes going past on the train. And in the center, there is the chef creating all of these dishes. The chef is like your mind, and the dishes are like all of those thoughts, ideas, memories that keep cropping up, coming and going all day long. Some of the dishes on that sushi train may be very appealing. Some of the stuff on that sushi train may be unappealing. And some of it may be neutral and take it or leave it. And it's much the same with our thoughts, memories, ideas that pop up throughout the day. Some of them are very pleasant, we really like them, we want them, we want to hold on to them. Some of them are very unpleasant and we just want to turn away from them, get rid of them. And a lot of them are kind of neutral, they're neither positive nor negative. So all day long the sushi chef of our mind is creating all these different dishes and the train keeps carrying them round and round. These thoughts keep cropping up throughout the day. Now we can learn to step back and watch our thoughts coming and going in much the same way that we can step back and watch that sushi train. An unpleasant dish pops up on the train. We don't have to turn away in disgust and horror. A pleasant dish comes by. We don't have to reach over and grab it and stuff it down our mouth. 
And we can do the same with our own thoughts. We can step back with an attitude of openness and curiosity and watch them come and stay and go in their own good time. All right, awesome. So again, with that video, what it's really aiming to do is try to illustrate that, you know, as humans, right, we always have things that are taking place, whether it's, um, you know, direct feelings that we're experiencing or things that we're seeing, you know, out in our environment. And sometimes, you know, it, it does make it a little bit challenging for our, ourselves. And so the idea is that can we just really watch these thoughts come and go rather than, you know, trying to really fuse into them um, and, you know, allow them to control some of our more overt behavior. Okay, so the next process refers to acceptance, and this is also known as opening up. But here what it's really looking at is to allow us to actively experience the events uh, as what they are and not um, as what they, what, what they say they are, right? So this means that feelings are exactly that, and then thinking thoughts as thoughts, as well as sensations as the sensations that we're feeling, and so on and so forth. So then when individuals are engaging in more of these private events during more undesired activities, there's less likelihood that we're going to be able to enjoy what's happening in front of us, right? And so this is where, you know, can it be that we can experience our environment, but in, ensuring that we're just, you know, allowing things to, to take place and not necessarily focusing so much in on them that they're then now impacting how we're enjoying, you know, everything around us. So here's another uh, video example to further illustrate that. So this one is titled The Struggle Switch. Um, and I'll play the video first and then I'll expand a little bit on it after. It often seems like we've got a struggle switch at the back of our mind. And as soon as an uncomfortable emotion, a painful feeling or memory shows up, it's like the, the struggle switch goes on and we start to struggle with it. So let's suppose anxiety shows up. A very common painful emotion that we all get to experience. Anxiety shows up, the struggle switch goes on. Oh, here's anxiety. I don't like anxiety. I want to get rid of my anxiety. Now I've got anxiety about my anxiety. So it's getting bigger. With the struggle switch on, I now get, oh, my anxiety's getting bigger. How do I get rid of my anxiety? Now I've got even more anxiety. With the struggle switch on, I may then get angry about my anxiety. Why does this anxiety keep showing up? I hate this anxiety. Then, I might even start to feel sad about my anger. Oh, is this my life? Oh, and then I may start to feel guilty about my sadness about my anger. Oh, how pathetic am I when there's starving kids in Africa? So with my struggle switch on, my emotions get amplified. I've now got guilt about my sadness, about my anger, about my anxiety, about my anxiety. And that kind of amplification of emotions gives them more impact and influence over my life and often gets me bogged down or pulls me into self-defeating behaviors. Now, what happens if I can switch off the struggle switch? With the struggle switch off, anxiety shows up and it's not that I like it or want it or approve of it, it's just I'm not going to struggle with it. I'm not going to invest my time, energy, and effort in struggling with this anxiety. Instead, I'm going to invest it in doing meaningful, life-enhancing activities, such as spending quality time with my friends and family, or playing with my kids. Now, with the struggle switch off, the anxiety is free to move. It may get higher, it may get lower, it may move quickly, it may move slowly, but the point is it's free to move. It doesn't get amplified by all of these other emotions which make it kind of bigger and stickier and make it hang around for a lot longer. So there's no such thing as a life without anxiety, it shows up for all of us. But when anxiety shows up and the struggle switch is off, it's so much easier to live with than when the struggle switch is on. So with that video, again, you know, what it's really trying to highlight is that there may be times where we may be experiencing things that are very uncomfortable. And so sometimes when we experience that, if we think about it a lot more, it will typically amplify, right? It'll provide us this like magnification and then it influences again our over behavior. So the idea here is that rather than, you know, over focusing on it, 
can it be that we can just let it be and you know really accept that it is part of just the human condition right that we're all going to experience all of these different emotions and with changing that perspective can it be that then we'll be able to focus on other things that are a lot more important to us and not necessarily hyper focus on the things that are you know really limiting us from more day to day action Okay, so from here, we can move on to the next process. So this is um, selfless context, also known as pure awareness. And so this refers to um, how an individual engages in behaviors upon tacting themselves in a situation. So with selfless context, it's referring to these behaviors that occur regardless of private events. So what we're doing here is altering one's dimension of, our, of the self that can then further function or alter the motivation to engage in certain behaviors. Um, so this, you know, for example, can be to evoke more appropriate behavior or to abate more inappropriate behavior. And so this particular skill is necessary for the individual to then be able to modify when they're engaging in more problematic private events. So the individual must then learn to engage in behavior regardless of the label that they've provided for themselves. So for example, if they're laying down on the bed without moving and they refer to themselves as, as lazy versus them getting up from the bed and going for a run regardless of what they've labeled themselves right so if this person is labeling themselves as lazy and they're engaging in that behavior right laying on their bed not doing anything but then let's say that they you know have said that sometimes they're a lazy person but even though they are a lazy person what's going to happen is that they're going to get up and they're going to go for a run you know to then be able to experience that particular activity uh, in in the day um, so with selfless context again another video to further illustrate um, so i'll go ahead and play this one Life is like a stage show, and on that stage are all your thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories and everything that you can see, hear, touch, taste and smell. And this show is changing all the time from moment to moment. And there's a part of you that can step back and watch that show. Zoom in and take in the details, zoom out and take in the big picture. Shine a spotlight on one part of the show to really illuminate what's happening there, or bring up the lights on the whole stage show all at once. And this part of you is what I like to call the observing self or the noticing self. And no matter what shows up on that stage, no matter how the show changes from moment to moment, this observing self part of you is always there, always available. So let's suppose you're out with a bunch of mates having a lovely meal at one of your favorite restaurants. And to begin with, your attention is all focused on your friends and the food, engaging in the conversation, enjoying the meal. But then, suddenly you hear this loud, annoying voice from a guy at the table behind you, and he's yakking on about something in this loud voice that really gets your goat. Suddenly the spotlight shifts, and all your attention is on this guy and what he's saying, and you're so irritated by the sound of his voice and the stuff that he's saying, and you're getting more and more wound up with everything that comes out of his mouth. So what's happened in the meantime, while all your attention is on this guy, your friends and this lovely meal have just faded into darkness. But what happens if you swing that spotlight back onto what matters most to you in this moment? Having a good time with your friends, having a laugh, sharing stories, enjoying the food. So the greater our ability to notice where our spotlight is shining and to redirect it to the part of the stage show that we really want to illuminate that matters most in this moment, the greater our ability to transform our experience of life. With that video, right, what it's uh, really looking to highlight is that you know, we can be in these different environments. We, we may be trying to enjoy what's happening in front of us, but sometimes there are things that are distracting 
us from really experiencing that. And so can it be that we can shift our attention, even though this may be something that's blocking, you know, everything that we're feeling and that we're thinking in the moment, but can it be that we can then shift our focus back to what's taking place so that we can really ex experience more of the, the positive experience that, that we'd like to see? And then another process to look at are what are called values, um, also known as knowing what matters. So this fifth process um, in connecting with values refers to rules that are alter our reinforcing value of stimuli. From a more of a behavior analytic perspective, uh, values will function similarly to motivating operations, except that they derive their functional properties through language rather than through a specific history with the environment. So then these values are going to alter the reinforcing or potentially punishing properties of the stimuli um, that a person has never been in contact with before and thus no potential history with. So a long-term goal that an individual initiates and then the company behaviors that they get to arrive there would be what is driving their their behavior, right? It's the overarching values that they've identified. So it is necessary for values to be put in place in order to initiate more concrete actions to get done. And these values are always going to be specific to the individual, and they're going to provide that greater motivation to them because they've identified what's important to them. The values will, you know, describe how one can behave in an ongoing basis to achieve what is more personal to them. So with this one, I do have one other video, and then I also want to um, showcase another exercise that allows somebody to really clarify some of the values that are important to them. But I'll go ahead and play this first. Society tells us the way to be happy is to achieve our goals. Get that great job, earn that money, get a good body, find a partner, have happy, healthy kids, have a big house, have a nice car, have holidays. Go, 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 go. And it's true that if you do actually manage to achieve these goals, then there is a little moment of joy and happiness. But how long does it last? How long before you're looking at the next goal and then the next goal and then the next goal? And as we live our life trying to constantly strive to achieve these goals, one after the other after the other, how tiring and exhausting does it get? Is this you? There is a radically different way to live your life, which is a life based on values, a values focused life. It's like two kids in the back of a car and it's a three hour car journey to Disneyland. And the first kid is totally goal focused. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer? Are we there yet? This journey of frustration, it's all about the goal. The second kid is values focused. He's got the same goal. He wants to get to Disneyland, but he's also in touch with his values around curiosity, adventure, having fun. So he's looking out of the window, playing I Spy with My Little Eye. He's counting all the, you know, the interesting farmhouses that he sees on the way. He's spotting interesting farm animals, cows and sheep. He's noticing different types of trucks and cars on the freeway. So he's actually appreciating the journey as he heads towards his goal. Now, they both reach Disneyland at the same time. They both have a fantastic time at Disneyland because they both got to achieve the goal. But the first kid had a journey of frustration. The second kid had a fulfilling, rewarding journey. Then on the way home, the first kid, are we home yet? Are we home yet? Are we home yet? All about the goal, all that frustration. Second kids looking out of the window, noticing how the world looks different at night, spotting the, the lights in the farmhouses and the cat's eyes on the freeway. The car breaks down on the way to Disneyland. Now both kids are really disappointed because neither of them achieve their goal. But the second kid at least had a fulfilling journey up until that point. Now, when the pickup truck arrives to tow them home, the first kid, Oh, it's not fair. I want to go to Disneyland. How long before the car gets repaired? It's not fair. It's not fair. The second kid starts to notice how the world looks different when you're sitting in the front of a pickup truck high above the level of the rest of the traffic. 
So this is the very important distinction between the values-focused life and the goal-focused life. In the values-focused life, we have the fulfillment and satisfaction of living our values every step of the way towards our goals, the satisfaction of achieving our goals, and the fulfillment that comes of living our values even when we don't achieve our goals. So <clears throat> with that video again, it's really you know, having us identify the things that are important to us and you know, can we move forward in a direction that's considering those values and really allowing us to experience everything that is around us you know, to the best of our ability. So with the illustration you know, that it showed, right, one child was a little bit more focused on getting to the end point, but then with the other child, they were really taking in everything that they saw along the way. And so values aims to do that. The values that we identify for ourselves allow us to really put into perspective what matters to us the most and can it be that we will experience as much as we can around us as we're moving towards some of these more um, you know long-term goals now i mentioned that i wanted to talk about a exercise that allows us to clarify our values so this is one that i've used on myself i've also used it with some clients as well it's called the bullseye exercise and what this is aiming to do is to get the person to try to understand what is important to them. So the values that are important to them in a few different domains. So it's important to say that values are not the same as goals, right? You saw in the video that there is a difference between the two. With values, again, it's this overarching idea of like what's important to us. And so the idea with values is that we're never going to get to that value. Like we're never going to meet that value 100%. But we can meet some of those goals along the way to work towards these values. So the bullseye is set up in a format where there's four different domains. So we have our work slash education, we have our leisure, we have our relationships, and then we have our personal growth. And so with work and education, that refers to the workplace, the career, education, knowledge, skills, development. And following that with the relationships, it's referring not necessarily um, to, you know, more like intimate relationships, but it does involve friendships. Uh, acquaintances, right, more uh, meaningful, potentially romantic relationships, um, you know, or like family relationships as well. Um, then with personal growth and health, what that's looking at is the ongoing development of the person as a human being. So this may include things like um, their organized religion, the personal expressions of their spirituality, their creativity, their life skills. And then finally, with leisure, it's re referring to the hobbies that the person engages in or the things that they do to rest or to engage in recreation or fun. And so the way that this is set up is that first you you know, look at the bullseye and you identify the values that are important in each of those domains. So perhaps to the individual, in work and education, what's important to them is that they're seen as somebody who is a hard worker, who's very organized, and who, you know, really likes to put in a lot of effort to their work and their education, right? So that's, those are some values that are really important to them. And then for this individual in the leisure domain, maybe some of the things that are important to them are creativity and, you know, being able to just have fun when they're engaging in more leisure type uh, experiences. Uh, with relationships, maybe some of the values that are important to them are being somebody who's committed to the relationship, you know, potentially somebody that has a really, you know, big heart and is very compassionate when they're engaging in some of these relationships. Uh, and then finally, in the personal growth and health, it could be that some of the values that are important to them are just being um, as fit as possible, right, or just being as nutritious as possible. Um, and so <clears throat> after the individual has identified the values for each of those domains, what happens next is that the individual is then directed to put an X on the uh, quadrant or the, the section in which the domain fits in. Of, and the, the way that it's outlined is that the closer you are to the middle, the closer that you are engaging in, in those values. And then the farther you are outward, the less likely that you're engaging in these uh, values. And so you know, when I work with clients, I always talk to them about how when we're looking at this, it's not that we're always going to be 100% on target, right? So as humans, in a more day-to-day -day approach, we're never going to be 100% living uh, close to our values because there are going to be, you know, some challenging moments along the way. But what it does mean is that can we get, you know, the person a little bit closer to the middle as opposed to them being farther away when th where they're not engaging in any of those values. And then following that, what happens is that once we've identified, one, the values to where they're represented on this bullseye, 
The next part helps them identify the potential obstacles that they're facing that's not allowing them to, you know, meet those or work towards those values that they're engaging in. And so then the final part with this exercise is to then start putting together some action-based goals to get that person to start engaging in these values, right? So, you know, again, with the person where with their work and education, you know, maybe one of their values, like I said before, is to be more organized. So what is a more um, action-based goal that they can engage in to become more organized? You know, can they um, purchase specific planners or set up some kind of reminders to get themselves to be a little bit more organized when they are at work? Because maybe for this individual, they're not always, you know, 100% organized all the time, but they want to be that type of person. And so then they're going to set things up in their environment to make them become a little bit more organized. Another example is for the relationships, right? So maybe, uh, you know, we said that, you know, one of the values for them is to be a compassionate person. And so, you know, can this mean that they'll engage in more, you know, thoughtful listening, right? When they're having these conversations with their loved ones, again, whether it's with a friend or a family or, you know, a partner. But the idea is that can they engage in more of this active listening um, approach when they're having these conversations. And so that can potentially help with making them, again, a little bit more compassionate because they're really hearing out the person that they're having a conversation with. And so again, I like to bring up this exercise because it is something that's very helpful. You know, I mentioned that I've done it for myself and then I've also implemented it with clients. But the idea here is that, you know, can we put into some into perspective what's important to us and then how we can fit that into the actual behaviors that we're engaging in. And then our last process that I'll talk about is committed action. So this one, I think, you know, if you're a behavior analyst or someone that's in the field, um, makes a lot more sense. Um, so this one is also known as doing what it takes. So with committed action, it's referring to motivating the client to engage in, the, in behaviors that help them function in healthier ways, right? And so this process, again, is the most familiar because it's a more observable, right? With the other processes that I've talked about, you know, they may sound a little bit mentalistic. And I think that the way that I've you know, maybe presented them are that way, but there's, you know, a lot that that's been done um, in research too, to really illustrate each of these processes. And so with committed action, we can see it as more of an extension of our values that have been set, right? And so this can be used with goal setting or some type of skills training. Furthermore, if it means that if we engage in over behaviors, even if that means that it may bring up some type of pain or discomfort, you know, we're still going to be moving towards these behaviors that are really important to us based on our values, right? So I mentioned earlier in the example about the person at work who wants to be more organized, right? They've identified organization as a value, but now with their committed action, can it be that they're going to be engaging in purchasing some of these planners or setting up reminders or blocking out specific times of the day to engage in some of these activities and then become a little bit more organized? One way to illustrate this is, or at least to further elaborate on this is to put together what are called SMART goals. So you may have heard of these. Uh, these are, you know, more um, of, of a traditional approach to how you, you put together a behavior. But with SMART goals, it means, you know, it's specific, it's measurable, achievable, um, and it's relative to the individual and also time bound. So each of the different letters in the SMART represent, you know, what I just stated. And so then it presents this really thorough goal that the person can work towards, right? So by this specific date, they're going to engage in this set of actions. And this is what it's going to look like once they're done with the, the behavior. Um, and so that's one way that we can, you know, help put together more of a committed action. The last video I'll show is just going to talk a little bit about committed action and how this is illustrated via the choice point. All day long, humans do things. Even if it's just sleeping. Now, some things we do move us towards the sort of life we want. When we're behaving like the sort of person we want to be, doing things that make life richer, fuller, more meaningful, we can call these towards moves. Now, other things we do move us away from the life we want to live. When we're acting ineffectively, behaving unlike the sort of person we want to be, doing things that tend to make life worse in the long term, we can call these away moves. Now, when things are going well, when life is giving us what we want, it's pretty easy for us to choose towards moves to act effectively, doing stuff that makes life richer and more meaningful. But unfortunately, life just isn't that easy most of the time, and it doesn't give us what we want for very long. 
So as we go about our day, all sorts of difficult situations and difficult thoughts and feelings will arise. We may experience emotions such as worry, we may catastrophize, predict the worst, we may have thoughts popping up that I'm not good enough, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, life sucks, it's all too hard. Now unfortunately, we easily get hooked by those difficult thoughts and feelings. And almost every psychological problem, from stress and anxiety to depression and addiction, boils down to this basic process. We get hooked by difficult thoughts and feelings, and we do away moves. However, there are times when most of us are able to unhook from these difficult thoughts and feelings and choose towards moves instead. And the better we get at doing this, the better life gets. So that's what this approach is all about. We're going to bring in some helpers to help you get a lot better at choosing towards moves. As a first step, we're going to help you identify your values, who you care about, what matters to you, what sort of person you want to be, and use those values to guide and inspire and motivate you to do more towards moves. And we're also going to develop unhooking skills so you can get a lot better and a lot faster at unhooking yourself from all those difficult thoughts, feelings, emotions and memories. The more we develop our ability to unhook and choose those towards moves that really matter deep in our heart, the greater our quality of life, the greater our health, happiness and well-being. Again, with all the processes that I talked about, what we're essentially looking at is what's called psychological flexibility. And so this is referring to an all-encompassing view of more uh, previously of the previously mentioned processes with being a little bit more present in the moment with full awareness, and then also being a little bit more open to our experience. Um, and from that, being able to take action that's guided by our values, right? So you can see that it's all works together to achieve what's called psychological flexibility. And then if we were to you know, see that from a different perspective, you know, at least with ACT as an acronym, we could say that um, A, the A in ACT is being able to accept your thoughts and feelings and be present. The C in ACT is choosing a valued direction. And then the T is taking action. So again, when delivering ACT as an intervention, it's aiming to really help the person move from the current suffering to more a life that, you know, has more vitality. Okay, so I want to also just briefly illustrate another example of uh, an act exercise. And so this is what's called the act matrix. So I'm just going to, you know, briefly mention what this is. Obviously, you know, for those that are viewing this, you can um, look at maybe expanding and, and completing a specific training on the act matrix. But this act matrix helps to really incorporate all of the processes within act. And so the way that this is set up is that there's uh, typically two lines that represent the act matrix. And so on the horizontal line, what we can do is we can actually label this our away moves, and then we can also label the opposite in our towards moves, right? And so here the idea is that we're trying to understand the things that we're potentially avoiding um, or, you know, getting away from, and then the things that are, are important to us that we're, that we're, you know, going in the direction of. And then in addition to that, uh, the vertical line represents the more inside and then the more um, outside or external type behaviors. And so with all of this, what's happening is that in our more inside and uh, towards moves, what we're looking at is the values that are important to us, right? So the things that we want to ensure that, that we're able to uh, move, move in the direction of. And then from there, what we can see is that uh, we also have on the opposite end, our diffusion, right? So our diffusion here, meaning that these are the things that are impacting so more of these internal thoughts and private events that are impacting our day-to-day -day functioning. Um, and then at the very top, uh, we have what we would label as more of our acceptance. So even though we may have, you know, a difficult time with whatever it is we're experiencing, we are still moving in the direction of what's important to us. Finally, we have our committed action. So in this quadrant here, we're talking about the actions that we're engaging in. So, you know, these overt behaviors that are tied back to our values that we're working towards.
And so, you know, it, with this act matrix, the way that it's set up is that, you know, the person who's completing it will go through each of the different quadrants and outline the things that are important to them. So first they'll talk about their values. Then they'll talk about the things that impact those values, right? So the things that are getting in the way. And then at the top, they'll talk about the more observable behaviors that they're engaging in, engaging in that uh, drives them away from what's important. And then finally, in the, uh, you know, top right quadrant, what is taking place is that can we here outline the things that are essentially very important to us that we would rather work towards and make part of our, um, you know, repertoire to make sure that we're, you know, meeting a, a life that is a little bit more uh, vital to us. What's next? So from a more per, uh, personal standpoint, what I recommend, you know, if this is something that's really new to you is to continue to engage in more formal and informal mindfulness practices via the use of act. So, you know, one thing to do is, is self-reflect on your values to really understand what is important to you. Um, and then look at how that ties back to your committed action, right? So after you've identified the things that are really important to you in life, can you then tie back, you know, the actions that you're engaging in? And is there alignment with each of those? And then potentially identifying values in some of the other domains, you know, similar to what I showed in the bullseye exercise. From a more professional standpoint, what I do recommend is, you know, do a few things to really immerse yourself in this content if it is something that's of interest. So one, there's an Act for Behavior Analysts uh, Facebook page, you know, to connect with other people who are in the field of behavior analysis that are implementing Act. Um, I also recommend to complete more um, personal applications of Act. So there's a lot of self-help books. One of them is Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. And then there's also the happiness trap. So you can, as you saw throughout the videos that I presented, I am very partial to Dr. Uh, Russ Harris, and he does a lot in ACT as well. Um, now, he's not a behavior analyst, but he is a doctor, and he showcases a lot of this and talks about it in a way that makes a lot of sense, you know, when we're trying to really understand these processes. Um, there's also an association for contextual behavioral science that has a lot of resources, whether it's like assessments or journals that relate back to ACT. And it's not just ACT specific, but there is a big part of that, that it does relate back to ACT. And there's also different podcasts that you can listen to. So uh, I know that the Behavioral Observations podcast does showcase a lot of different um, episodes where they talk about ACT. And then there's also a website, praxiscet.com, where they do offer additional workshops and webinars by other behavior analysts as well. Um, I know that they've had in the past like a boot camp for behavior analysts where the people, uh, behavior analysts can go to uh, the present, it's like a conference, a two-day conference, and then they're able to really uh, get learning from others that are practicing in the field. And then some additional resources. So I know that as I went through this presentation, you know, I talked about how we can use this on ourselves to really understand it. And again, I always really try to drive that point home because I think without understanding all of that, it is then hard to implement that with clients if, if you're going to be using this with clients. Um, but there are some additional resources. So there's the AIM curriculum, which focuses on incorporating ACT uh, with uh, school age children. And so there's like a specific curriculum on how you can in incorporate ACT into the classroom setting. There's also the joy of parenting, which is uh, more of a um, understanding of how ACT can be used with parents, again, to really help them, you know, work through some of those challenging situations that they may be experiencing as a parent, while still implementing some of these behavior change procedures. <clears throat> There's also ACT Made Simple, which is a self-help book that, you know, really just talks about ACT in like the easiest way possible. So that's also a really good place to start. And then there's also The Mindful and Effective Employee, which is another book that talks about ACT in the work context as it relates to like stress and burnout and everything else. And then finally, here are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. We have a question. Do you have any recommended books or did you recommend any books? Maybe you can uh, share it with me where you can put it in the chat. Yeah, so I mean, I could always, you know, provide like a, a list that um, I could always provide it after, but a lot of the ones that I mentioned right now in the in the slides, I would say start off with, I mean, I always recommend to start off with uh, some, something like Act Made Simple, that's the name of the actual book, because it talks about Act in a very straightforward, simple way, and it allows the person to really just understand, and then from there, again, if you are a behavior analyst, um, you know, going back into um, more of the, um, you know, uh, like the the behavior analytic approach to all of this so that it could still make sense you know from that perspective are there any top apps that you use for mindfulness you know so there's there's actually one um and i think it's called um the act coach and it is it's an app that you can actually download and it helps you work through each of the different processes <clears throat> that's really the only one that i've been able to look at but 
<clears throat> with mindfulness in general, I mean, I think one other is that I've used like with myself and even with clients um, has been um, the Headspace app, which is again, like small opportunities to be able to practice just that present moment awareness. Because again, if we go back to all the processes that I talked about, mindfulness is just one part of ACT, but it is still a big part of it, right? So we're trying to teach the individual to be a little bit more present so that then they are, you know, really just trying to, to be as present as possible in the moment and focus on, on what's happening. And so that app, Headspace, uh, it's, a, it's a meditation mindfulness app and you can set it up where you would actually like set small goals to practice every day. So maybe like every day you're going to practice one minute of mindfulness or you can extend that. You can say five minutes or 15 minutes. <clears throat> but the idea is that with a lot of these different processes, you're practicing them as much as you can because it's the same thing with any other skill, right? If we're, let's say on, um, you know, a baseball team, uh, you know, the person who doesn't practice as much may not do as well during the actual games. Um, and so we can say the same thing for ourselves. If we're not practicing these processes in a few different ways, then, you know, we may not be experiencing it to the full extent that we can. And I think what I love about ACT is, you know, as, you know, a person who's, you know, my background is behavior analysis, where right? it's like, okay, well, we don't really count private events because we can't mm -hmm. and observe, but I love how ACT is like, no, well, we do need to look into that um, and we need to figure out ways to be more mindful, be more present um, mm -hmm. to then be able to achieve a lot of these other behavioral things that we might. Yeah. I mean, I'll mention too, just to give some more like context. So it, um, I, I mentioned previously that I use it with clients and when I use it with clients, you know, I don't obviously give them this presentation, but what I do is I take bits and pieces of it to really help them just kind of work through the process. So for example, in the present moment awareness um, process, right, I've used that with some clients where we're teaching them some like simple breathing techniques or even the grounding exercise that I showed you where they label five things and you know that they see four things that they um, that they can touch and so on and so forth <clears throat> so we've actually taken that and we've actually written out a task analysis for clients and we have them go through each of them so they you know label five things they see four things that they can touch three things they hear you know two things that they can smell one thing that they can touch and so with some clients, you know, that, that I work with, even if they may have a very limited like verbal repertoire, they, we can then potentially teach them to just start labeling some of the things around them. And so we, we work, you know, in that way. Um, and then in addition to that, we may work on some imitation skills. So let's say they're, they're not engaging in really good, you know, deep breathing. So we may be able to help with that by um, having them imitate, you know, our breathing in and out. And, you know, in the video, they talked about a deep uh, belly breath. And so we may actually practice that. And so what happens is that we practice this over and over with the client so that then they're able to engage in, in this type of grounding technique. Again, even though they may not have like, you know, extensive verbal re repertoire, but they still have a lot of these behaviors that they can engage in to get them back to the moment. Because, you know, the idea with <clears throat> ACT again is that it's taking um, the person it, to like pause in, in some sense before they start engaging in these behaviors. So think about you know, if I'm working with a client who's engaging in, you know, a lot of physical aggression, what typically happens is that there's a trigger to that behavior, and then they immediately start engaging in physical aggression, right? So can it be that we can buffer that by um, helping them practice these breathing techniques? So then the trigger happens, then we prompt them to engage in their grounding technique, and that provides a little bit of a pause before they actually engage in that physical aggression. And so, you know, there's a, a lot of really cool ways how that ties back into, you know, just working with, you know, clients. Um, you know, for the audience, I don't know if everybody here is a behavior analyst or not, but, um, you know, same thing with us. I mean, think about those situations where we are, you know, feeling very frustrated or emotional um, and, and it's okay, right? Sometimes it is okay to feel those ways, but then it's like what happens after that really affects us as a person. So if we're, you know, trying to not fuse too much into it, can we take a, a pause by using something like one of those grounding exercise to then get, get ourselves back into the present before we you know, respond reactively to, to what's happening next. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. I don't think we have any other questions, but thank you guys so much. Have a great one. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.